We're going to turn now to God's Word, the Bible. The passage we're reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 8. And if you'll know, we've been journeying through this first book of the Bible these last few weeks. <clears throat> when we begin Genesis 8, we're in the middle of the flood. Verse 24 of Genesis chapter 7 reads, The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heaven had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The waters receded steadily from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to receive until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window he'd made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the, of the ground. Uh, but the dove could not find anywhere to perch because there was no water, because there was water above all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out uh, his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again he sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, uh, there was in his beak a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 600 year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so that they may multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. All the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse, this, curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all the living creatures that I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Well, let's quickly ask God to speak into our hearts as we... Uh, look into this passage in a bit more depth. Father, thank you that you promised to speak through uh, your word, your living word, this Bible that you have uh, given us in a language that we can understand. We thank you for that. And we ask now as we uh, just spend a few moments uh, contemplating what this has to say to us, we, open, we ask that you would open our hearts, open our ears, and draw us near. To you we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I was talking to somebody recently uh, about keeping up with children when they go off to university. We've got a few uh, amongst us that are currently uh, away from us at college or university. Uh, now, with today's uh, technology, it's much easier, isn't it, to keep in touch with uh, with individuals compared with what it was a generation ago. I've got a picture here that you young people would never have seen uh, in your lives. This is a phone card. 
Uh, some of us remember queuing up at phone boxes to, to use these things. Uh, and then once we got there, after the hours that we had to queue, we discover after three or four minutes that it's run out of credit. Uh, you don't experience any of these things uh, these days. But despite all of this, the survey evidence that we uh, hear of, uh, and I think it's something that we'd acknowledge probably anecdotally uh, as well, there is more loneliness today than there has ever been. I mean, perhaps it might be that this tech can kind of almost work against us in that we begin to feel abandoned and, and forgotten much more quickly than we used to because we know that people have access to all this technology and if they wanted to, they could, they, they could get in touch with us. Previously, they th we, we, we tended to think that well, they didn't bother because, or, or, or they didn't get in touch simply because they couldn't. Well, now we know they can and we feel lonely and forgotten very quickly uh, when they don't. I'm sure we all uh, have had this feeling of abandonment at times. Somebody you thought was a friend does not respond to your calls or your uh, messages. Maybe you're struggling with a, a project at school uh, where it seems that you're the only one finding this thing difficult. Uh, or when your social media friends fail to like your posts. That uh, quickness to feel unwanted, I think, can, uh, can affect our Christian relationship with God as well. Because we treat each other like that. We kind of expect God uh, to be much the same, kind of there at our beck and call. And I know, I'm sure you know, what it's like to feel forgotten by God. You, you've, you've asked him for, for, for forgiveness. You've put your trust in the Lord Jesus. You've, you've committed your lives to him. And you pray to him uh, regularly. But if we're honest, a lot of the time it feels like there's not much coming back our way. Now, I want us to take encouragement. We should take encouragement from all the examples in God's word of individuals that felt like this. Can you imagine how it felt for the Israelites, for example, for those 400 years that they spent in Egypt, for most of that time as slaves? Would they not have thought for a moment that God had forgotten them? And some of the Psalms that we read were written by people feeling and expressing exactly these kinds of feelings. And the Lord Jesus himself quoted one of those. Why have you forsaken me, he said, when he was dying on the cross? And now what about Noah? Noah. Uh, as we read about him in our passage, uh, 40 days, 40 nights might not seem like a very long period, perhaps. But if you imagine you're locked inside a big box uh, without any daylight, uh, there's no real windows in here. I think, I think I've got a picture here. Or just to remind you, once again, this is the one uh, that, was, that has been built in, in, in America. There, there are no windows in the ark. It's a dark, dark place and you're floating around on water that you have never seen before some of you i mean you're in this place you've possibly never seen a lake or or the sea in your lives and suddenly you are floating around on the sea you've got no idea what you might be about to crash into you know there's kind of mountains around you you've got no idea whether this thing is going to stay afloat all the time that you're on it everything is completely outside of your control and I can't imagine that can have been an easy experience for these people on the ark. Yes, they've been saved from the flood. I'm sure they were uh, eternally grateful for that salvation. Uh, but they're completely at sea, literally at sea. And they've got no, I no idea really how long this journey is going to last. They've got the 40 days, but they don't know how long uh, it's going to be. Do you not think that... Any of these eight, that, or seven rather, that were with Noah there on the ark, would they not at any point cried out to God and said, kind of, where are you? How long is this going to go on for? Now, I doubt that there's a Christian amongst us or a Christian perhaps that's ever existed who's never felt like that at times. Maybe you're feeling like that a little bit right now. You're thinking that God has forgotten. In fact, I, I know from some of the conversations I have with some of you that that is the case. Uh, even now, life is not easy. Well, Genesis chapter 8 begins 
But God remembered Noah. And the big message to each one of us this morning is this. God never forgets. He never forgets his rescued people. Maybe you're not a Christian yet, but you're thinking about it. You haven't quite got to that point of publicly or or even privately putting your trust in the Lord Jesus. Well, this message is for you as well. God never forgets those who put their faith in Jesus. It's a message, I think, increasingly in today's world that we all need to hear. The Lord is not distant. He cares more than we can imagine, far more than we know. And he will deliver us. He has promised he will deliver us into the promised land. And he is going to be with us every step of the way. We just don't know how many days or months or years that is going to take. And this thing about time, days and months and years, comes quite a lot in Genesis chapter 8. I don't know if you noticed that as we were reading through. Uh, By my uh, counting, there were 12 references to either the number of days or or the number of months or, or the number of years in terms of people's ages, for example. And also from my calculations, you can check this for yourselves. I'm sure someone will correct me afterwards. But I reckon it was about seven months between the time that uh, Noah and his family and the animals entered the ark, seven months between then and when they finally came out of the ark. Seven months is quite a long time. It wasn't just those first 40 days. And that is a long time for a cruise, isn't it? I remember this ship had no balconies where you can kind of look out onto the still sea and enjoy the view. It had no kind of... I've never been on a cruise, so I've got really no idea. But all you can eat restaurants, they have plenty of those, don't they, on cruises? No evening entertainment. Can you imagine that in Noah's day? And I'm guessing that the beds they had to sleep on, if they had beds, they weren't quite, or they weren't that comfortable. And let's remember, I mean, we've talked a lot in the last two or three weeks about the salvation that God gave to Noah and his family. He had, they had been rescued from God's awful judgment. But, but the way of salvation, the, the path, it was hard. It involved a lot of significant suffering. So, so if Genesis chapter 7, as we saw uh, last week, was a picture of God's uh, et- eternal plan of salvation... Well, what we're seeing here in Genesis chapter 8 is a picture of his promise to be with us on the journey. But what does it mean uh, when it says here, at the beginning of chapter 8, that God remembered uh, Noah? Now, if you don't know God, or if you never come across the Bible, you might be thinking, well, this is, is this God just getting a little bit old and, uh, and forgetful? And if that was the case, that would be pretty unfortunate, wouldn't it? Right, right at the beginning of the Bible, I mean, it doesn't hold out much hope for the rest of uh, the Bible, if that's what God is like. Or, or maybe God was kind of looking around, he thought, oh, I'll see what's going on down there, and he spots this ark bobbing around in the water and thinks, oh yeah, that's Noah, isn't it? I better pop down and see how he's doing. It's not like that at all. God never took his eyes off of Noah for one uh, moment. This, this simply means that there's a, there's a turning point. It, it, it's a, that the time had come to enact the next part of God's plan. <clears throat> Judgment was now over. The problem of evil had been dealt with. The need for the flood, therefore, had gone. It was a time to get rid of the water. It's a turning point. Uh, we see this at the beginning of chapter 8 here, verse 2. It says the rain had stopped. The waters, verse 1 and verse 3, had begun to Recede. That word recede comes out several times as well. It's the end of judgment. Things are now new. The sun is coming out. Uh, creation order has been resumed. And in fact, Genesis chapter 8 is a, a very similar picture to the one that you get in Genesis chapter 1, right back at the beginning. And I'm not sure why uh, our English translations, I don't think they're very helpful here in terms of this word wind in verse 1 of chapter 8. It says, God sent a wind over the earth. Well, the Hebrew word is exactly the same word that you get in Genesis chapter 1. And I think verse 1, 
where it talks about, uh, verse 2, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. The Spirit on ch in chapter 1 and wind in chapter 8 are the same word. This is God's Spirit again, hovering over the waters. The same thing is happen, happening by the power of God's Spirit. And just as we found in the beginning, in chapter 1, here in chapter 8, we see the waters being separated and dry land uh, appearing. And Noah is given this same instruction that, that Adam was given uh, in chapter 1 to go forth to... Uh, be fruitful, uh, and to uh, multiply. So Genesis chapter 1, we see creation. Genesis chapter 8, we see re-creation. All things are being made new. But as we know, looking back at this, Genesis chapter 1, uh, creation didn't last very long. Uh, and neither did Genesis chapter 8, creation. Those of us whose trust is in the saving work of the Lord Jesus, we are traveling towards another new creation. I want us to turn, if you wouldn't mind, to, to, to Revelation chapter uh, 21, which, which promises a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, but I want us to read the first few verses of Genesis chap uh, uh, Revelation chapter 22. Yeah, I mean, do turn to it. I have put the words up on the uh, screen there as well. It may be helpful. <clears throat> then the angel showed me the river. So we're talking here about what's coming in the future, and it's still in the future for us today. A river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's the Lord Jesus down the middle of the river stood the tree of life. Remember the tree of life from uh, Genesis chapter 2? Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now that's the future. That's the future for each one of us in uh, the Lord Jesus. In some respects, we are like Noah and his family. We've been rescued from our sin. The Lord Jesus has taken upon himself the judgment that we deserved. We are safely in this ark that is Christ alone. We're experiencing the ups and the downs, uh, the turbulence of this sea of uh, life. There are good times, but there are many tough and bewildering times. And we, we can't see the destination uh, with our own eyes. And uh, sometimes we're kind of surprised by that. But in any journey that we take, we can rarely see where we're going uh, much before we get there. We shouldn't be surprised uh, about that. We just need to trust the means of transport. And we know that this one is going to arrive. I'm not going to say anything derogatory about any of our means of transport. We, but we do know that this one will arrive at the right time in the right place. Josh has already shown us this uh, example, the way that God keeps his promises from uh, the last couple of verses of our chapter in Genesis chapter uh, 8. And the one who promises these things in Revelation chapter 22, he is the same God. He will keep his promises just as one season flows into uh, another. And we know that happens. We've seen it happens. Every one of us have seen that time and time again. Just as we know that happens, we know that God will keep this promise to deliver us safely into eternity. So what do we do? We wait. We wait. God could have, of course, in chapter 8 of Genesis, he could have got rid of all of that water in a moment. That wouldn't have been difficult for him. Why didn't he? And why doesn't he deliver us safely to the kingdom uh, eternally right now? Well, he chooses not to. He was teaching them a lesson, and he's teaching us a lesson of patience. 
Psalm 27 verse 4 gives us this clear instruction. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart and wait for the Lord. Because God never forgets his rescued people. That, that is the, the, the big message this morning. But underlying that, there's this. He always, he's always with us on the journey. His, uh, let me get that. God, God never leaves. So if he never forgets his rescued people, he never leaves his rescued people. Now I started a few moments ago by saying that it can feel like God has uh, forgotten us, that he's abandoned us even. And I trust we've seen, even from this example of Noah, that those are just feelings that we have, feelings that come, uh, feelings that go. And we can't always trust those feelings. They don't always reflect the reality that God never leaves us. And they don't always reflect this reality that God never uh, forgets us. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. Matthew chapter 28. Well-known words, these. Then Jesus came to them, his disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, surely, I am with you always. I am with you always, even to the end of the age, right up until the last moment. I am with you. So as our hearts are, are, are opened up to the presence of the Lord Jesus, so, uh, uh, so he, his spirit comes down and he enters our hearts, never, never to depart. That is the promise. He is with us always. Now, last week we saw that Noah was a, a picture or a, a type of the coming uh, Messiah. The repeated uh, emphases on, on Noah's obedience and faithfulness, particularly in chapters 6 and 7, are meant to remind us of the truly perfect, the truly obedient one who was still uh, to come. But, but Noah, he, he was a good man in his time, but he was a pale shadow of the one who was to come. His, his presence on the ark, it was a, a message to uh, the rest of his family. He was a shadow. He was kind of like the presence of the Lord Jesus in some ways, uh, even to the animals. It was this message that God had not left them. Noah was there with them in the ark. And he was the one who ensured they didn't get off too early uh, via the, 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 the story of the raven, uh, and, and the, the, the dove that went out. But Noah, even more importantly, was the one that God spoke through. Did you notice that? Throughout these chapters, Noah seems to be the one, the only one, that God speaks uh, directly to. Now, certainly among some Christian circles today, uh, there's this real desire for God to speak to us in a, in a really direct way, almost as if what we have in the Bible is just not enough. We, we need God to speak directly into our hearts, into our lives. And some people do experience that. But often the way it can come across is, is as if, if you haven't had such an experience of the Spirit speaking to you in such a direct way that you are somehow missing out on something. Well, listen to this from Hebrews chapter 1. It says, in the past, and it's speaking to Christians here just like us, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, think of Noah, at many times, various ways. But in these last days, these last days in which we live today, he has spoken to us by his son, who he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. There is no one greater that he could speak to us through. And when we read the very words of scripture, we, we can read the words of Jesus himself, of course, uh, but the whole of God's word is, is Jesus speaking to us. It is God's own voice because Jesus is the word of God. So we don't need him to speak to us in any other way he does. Uh, he often speaks to us through uh, events, uh, through our experiences. But we don't need him to speak to us in any other way. In fact, 
I think we need to be really careful about the voices that we listen to uh, around us because there are other powers around us that are quite keen to deceive us. And whenever uh, we do hear anything and we think it might be God's word speaking to us, we do need to check it against scripture uh, to make sure it's consistent. We have God's word. The spirit of Christ will never leave us. The God of heaven will never forget us. But for me, I, and again, I don't know if you noticed this, as I read through this passage, there was still something in here that just didn't quite add up. You remember the reason that God sent the flood, right? Back in chapter 6, let's uh, just read a couple of verses uh, there again from, I think, verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he'd made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So he said, I'm going to wipe humanity from the face of the earth. The, 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 the human heart, this, this problem of the human heart was there before the flood, and that was why God sent the flood. But look again here in chapter 8. What did God say to Noah immediately after the flood? Verse 21. Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. He seems to be confirming immediately after the flood uh, that the human heart was no better now uh, than it was before the flood. Uh, and that fact is confirmed uh, pretty much in the next chapter and throughout the rest of the Bible. Uh, and it's confirmed in the world that we live in today. It's confirmed in our own hearts if we're, look, if we're looking closely enough. This is, these things are still true. Every inclination of the human heart is is only evil. We, we all treat God's creation badly at times. We, we, we all treat each other badly quite a lot of the time. And we all treat God badly, I'm going to say pretty much most of the time. The heart problem, this problem of the human heart, is still here. So I'm left with a question. We're left with this question as we close. How does God still put up with us? How is it that God still puts up... I mean, put it another way. Uh, why isn't there a flood every day? Why doesn't God just get rid of us? Just like he did the people of that day. Well, there's a pretty amazing answer to that question. And it's here in our passage. Uh, we see it right across the Bible as we read through, gloriously, in the Lord Jesus. And it's in one word. It's the word sacrifice. Verse 20, Noah... Uh, built an, ark, uh, uh, an altar rather to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. This is a bit strange. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again, never again. So there was purpose in having more than one pair of clean animals in the ark. Otherwise... Things couldn't have carried on very easily. Um, whereas God's heart back in chapter 6 was deeply troubled when he saw the evil uh, before the flood, now it seems his heart is, is pleased because of the sacrifice. Now this is not an easy thing for us to get our heads around, but this is how, because of sacrifice, this is how God can be uh, merciful whilst at the same time not sweeping injustice under the carpet. It, it, evil has to be paid for. Either we take the penalty ourselves, or something or, or, or someone else must pay the price. Now the Bible does tell us about another occasion where God smelt the aroma of sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 5, we've already referenced Ephesians this morning, but here's Ephesians chapter 5, written again to Christian believers. Uh, Paul the Apostle writes... Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. 
Just as, as Noah was a shadow of the Savior to come, so the animal sacrifices in that day, they were a shadow of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus shed for us on the cross. And in a way that we, we can't really understand, uh, God kind of smelt this aroma of Christ's death on the cross, and he was satisfied with that. It meant that he could turn away his right anger against sin. It was a fragrant, a pleasing aroma. And, of course, there's so much more we could say about this. I doubt there's many sermons where we fail to reference what happened on the cross. But very simply, it's the reason that a, a holy God does not send a flood to destroy us every day. If you've been on the ark for seven months, what would you do the first uh, step that you took after you came off the ark? Seven months in this big box. What would the first thing you would do? Well, you might well organize a party. Uh, if you had access to fireworks, I reckon you'd send a few of those up into the sky. Or maybe, for the introverted amongst us, we might find a quiet spot where we can just get away from all of these people that we've been spending the last seven months with and the smell of the animals. Can you imagine what that was like? And just find, find a, a quiet corner on our own. Well, what does Noah do? The first thing he does when he gets off of the ark is to build an altar and to sacrifice burnt offerings on it. That was the most important thing that Noah could do the moment he got off of the ark. Now we are safe, gloriously, we are safe from God's almighty hand of justice only but completely when our trust is in the perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus upon the cross. That is the uh, most important thing that we can possibly do. So however uh, lonely or, or, or abandoned you might be feeling this morning, God has not forgotten you. However hard you're finding this journey of life, perhaps particularly as you get towards the end, if your faith is in the living Lord Jesus, his spirit will never, never leave you. And if you're standing on this rock, the rock of the, the, which is the foundation uh, that, that is the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, then you will always be safe from the judgment of God. Let's pray as we close. Father, we thank you for that promise that we've just sung, uh, that we've just read of in your word, that you will never, no, never, never forsake. We thank you that you will never forget us. And even though we may feel uh, lonely, abandoned, perhaps by one another, uh, perhaps even by you, we thank you that you have made it very clear that you will never depart from us that you are with us by your Holy Spirit every moment of every day, if our trust is in the Lord Jesus, if he is our firm foundation. Father, we thank you that these things can be true because of that precious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, because it was found to be a fragrant, a pleasing aroma in a way that we simply can't understand. You found the death of the Lord Jesus an acceptable sacrifice. And that when we are found in him, when our faith is in him, we too are safe from your righteous judgment. Father, help us, we pray, to equally be uh, through the sacrifice of our lives for your sake in a different way, but in, in a wholehearted way. Help us to be uh, a fragrant offering, we pray, to you, uh, that will be a blessing to each other, that will be a blessing to those uh, around us whom we long to come to know 
the Lord Jesus for himself. Those perhaps in our own households as we go back in just a few minutes. Those in our schools, in our workplaces as we uh, might encounter in the coming days. Those in our neighborhoods, in our shops, in our uh, community. Help us, we pray, to be a pleasant aroma to those around us. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.